Okay. Uh, Edwin, you can uh, share your screen. Yeah, sure. Okay, let me give a short introduction. Our next speaker is Edwin Bounce from Virginia Tech. Uh, Edwin, uh, I think he was a postdoc in CN at CNTC some time ago. And uh, today he's going to tell us about the quantum error uh, mitigation and the level of uh, how well control from spin echo to geometric space curve. Uh, Edwin, please. Thanks a lot. Uh, yes, yeah, so I want to switch the topic a little bit to quantum control. And um, let's see. Yeah, so first I just want to mention that I'm, I benefit from being part of a large group at Virginia Tech working on various topics in quantum information theory. Uh, that includes a few other faculty aside from myself and I'd say on the order of 20 students and postdocs working in these areas. So we work on a number of topics ranging from quantum simulation algorithms to quantum communication protocols. And uh, today I'm gonna to focus on quantum control. So I think we're all familiar with the, the issue of control, especially as it becomes more prevalent with systems becoming larger and larger. So these are just some snapshots of superconducting circuits, spins and quantum dots and trapped ion systems that have um, demonstrated control on a, on a larger scale of tens, a few tens of qubits. And a major obstacle already that arises at this level is how you control these systems. And we're already in getting into a regime where simulating the quantum dynamics of these devices on a classical computer is becoming intractable. And so it's a, it's a really hard problem to figure out how you can design controls for these systems. And a really big issue that comes into play is how good can that control get? Ultimately, we want, we want error corrected qubits of some kind or another. And at least if you're doing you know, the ordinary qubit based approach to this, you need to have sufficiently good single qubit control and two qubit control in order to reach quantum correct, uh, error correction thresholds. And so this talk is about trying to understand how we can reach those thresholds. So interactions with the environment cause noise and decoherence. Um, a better understanding of materials and devices can, is a huge part in mitigating this problem. And there's been tremendous progress over the last decade or two in isolating these types of noises and, and reducing them inside the device. But ultimately, we can't completely isolate the qubits. We're interested in doing operations on them, which means that there's always going to be some channel opened up that brings in noise into the system. And so we also, in tandem to improving device designs and materials, we need to figure out how to improve the control that we apply to the system. And in particular, can we combat noise at the so-called software level? You know, we, when we send in electromagnetic pulses or whatever to rotate spin qubits or other types of qubits, can we do so in such a way that not only can you perform the operation you want with high fidelity, can you, uh, at least in part, decouple the system from its environment? So this is an old idea dating back to the 1950s, where the, the first example I know of that does this kind of thing is called Hans Spin Echo, where the idea is that you have a, say a spin, a single spin that's uh, experiencing a fluctuating magnetic field. And so if you run the experiment once, you prepare the spin along some axis, let it process under the field. If you run the experiment, say six different times, then, and stop it at some final time, you, you end up with spin vectors that point along various directions. And typically in these experiments, you have to average over many runs of the experiment to get a large enough signal. But what uh, Han showed is that if you apply a very strong pulse halfway through the evolution, you instantaneously flip all the spins. And then if you wait the same amount of time afterwards, then all these different runs of the experiment, the spin states in each case, that they're going to coalesce again on the opposite side of the blocks here. And so you can, you can restore the signal. So this is a, a simple idea that's been extended in various ways in the last seven decades. Uh, for example, an obvious thing you could do is to apply more delta function pulses uh, to your system. And in the case of purely quasi-static noise, if every time you run the experiment, the noise is just some constant, for example, and then for the magnetic field, the field has the same value during the, the application of a, a single run of the experiment, but it changes from one run to the next. In this case of quasi-static noise, it doesn't matter how many delta functions you send in, it's going to be the same. You're going to cancel the noise. But in reality, the noise has some time dependence. The field fluctuates during the run the, during a single run of the experiment. And so by applying more delta functions, you can, you can reduce the effects of the noise in that case compared to doing a single pulse. So these are just some schematics of different famous delta function sequences that people have come up with over the last 70 years. And these have been already widely employed in quantum information technologies of various sorts. These are three examples of spin qubits, phosphorus donors and silicon, um, 
NV centers in diamond and spin, electron spin qubits and quantum dots. In every case, they've seen, seen tremendous improvement in T2 star times by using these sequences. So in this talk, I'm more interested in knowing how we can use the same basic idea, but now not only preserve quantum states, but also perform operations on them at the same time. So this we refer to as dynamically corrected gates. So you can imagine for simplicity, just picture a single qubit Hamiltonian like this. And your driving field is this omega t along the x direction. Delta is a constant energy or detuning along the z direction. Each of these things can fluctuate due to interactions between your qubit and its environment. And the question is, can you design your driving field omega t in such a way that you remove at least the leading order errors caused by these fluctuations? So if I write down the, the actual evolution operator under this Hamiltonian, I'm going to generate the target evolution, the, the logical gate I want. And then hopefully if I've designed omega of t appropriately, I will cancel at least the first order in epsilon and delta omega and improve the fidelity as a consequence. So this is also an idea that's been around for at least two decades. There are a number of papers um, that come up with various schemes to achieve this kind of cancellation, either using group theory or numerics or other techniques. And they work um, in some cases and not in others. It depends a lot on the details of the experimental system in question and what exactly you're trying to do. So my entry into this field happened about 10 years ago now where um, the question which was originally posed by Charlie Marcus, I think, um, to a number of us postdocs at, at Maryland at the time was whether we can come up with control schemes for his singlet triplet spin qubits in quantum dots. And so there we immediately run into the problem that you know, even though various um, control sequences from nuclear magnetic resonance have been developed long before that point, they're, they're largely inapplicable to this particular system because here the main control on the qubit is the exchange interaction between two electron spins in neighboring quantum dots. And this thing is almost always positive or at least non-negative. And whereas in NMR, they typically think about time-dependent magnetic fields rotating spins through ESR type uh, physics. And there you can easily generate uh, fields that go positive and negative, positive and negative, and so there's no issue there. So translating those NMR sequences to spins and quantum dots was non-trivial, at least for single triplet qubits. And so our task was to see if we can do something along those lines, but respecting this uh, non-negativity constraint. And in a series of works, we showed that it is indeed possible. You can do all kinds of uh, gate operations while canceling multiple kinds of noise afflicting the qubit at the same time. This is an example of one of these sequences that we developed. Um, a nice thing about square pulses, which is why they were so heavily explored in NMR, is that they're analytically solvable. You can solve the Schrodinger equation because each, during each piece of the evolution, the Hamiltonian's constant, so you can just diagonalize it and compute the evolution operator. Um, but experimentally, they're not so easy because in reality, especially in systems like uh, spins in quantum dots or superconducting qubits, the evolution times are on the scale of tens of nanoseconds. And in that case, you cannot generate uh, reliably waveforms that are, have this square shape where you turn it on instantaneously and turn it off instantaneously. The actual signal that reaches the sample is some deformed version of that, which nobody quite knows what it looks like, but it's definitely not a square. And that's ultimately um, a, a major headache in trying to calibrate these kinds of sequences. So that got me to thinking uh, a while back whether we could do something a bit more general. Can we get away from this idealized pulse shape assumption? And can we use can we find smooth pulses that do the same thing? And this led into an interesting story that connects quantum evolution to geometry and in particular differential geometry that I'm gonna tell you a bit about. So to get started, the, the first thing I want to think about is the simplest case where we just have a single qubit and I have some driving field along the x-axis. And here I'm going to assume that all I have on the, the z-axis is this stochastic noise parameter epsilon. So here I'm thinking about the simplest thing, quasi-static noise, meaning that during the gate, the noise just induces this unknown um, but constant parameter epsilon. And so the, the task is to figure out if I look at the evolution operator, I can expand it in powers of epsilon. And so at zeroth order, I get the target evolution I want. Um, <clears throat> but then I have these noise terms order by order in epsilon. And of course, the goal is to try to somehow make these terms cancel by choosing the driving field appropriately. And so I need each of these coefficients. These are complex coefficients of time, these g sub n's. m sub n is just some two by two matrix that's constant. 
If I can arrange for these coefficients to vanish at some final time t, then I'm effectively decoupling my system from the environment. And interestingly, you can show that these coefficients uh, order by order satisfy this recursion relation that depends on the driving field you apply. So all the original um, dynamical decoupling sequences from NMR, like spin echo, CPMG, and so on, they can all be derived from this, this point of view. You can try to find sequences of delta functions, plug them in for omega t, and figure out how you can cancel g. So that's the way you derive all those things. Um, so we are interested in seeing if we can do something more general than that. Let's not assume any particular pulse shape. And a, a very um, interesting approach, it turns out, that you can take is to take the first order coefficient. This is g sub 1. This is a complex function of time. So I can plot it on a complex plane. And at t equals 0, it starts at the origin. As time evolves, it traces out some curve in this complex plane. So that's all kind of obvious. And I can call this the error curve if I want, because this is basically just giving me a measure of how big the error is becoming as time progresses, because this is, after all, the coefficient of the first order, the leading order error term in my evolution operator. But now what's interesting is that if I stop at some point along the curve and compute the curvature, by which I mean find a circle that has that the same amount of bend as the curve itself at that point, and look at the inverse radius, it's exactly given by the driving field omega of t. So the curve of this error curve is the pulse. And moreover, it turns out that the length of the curve up to this point, if I, if I compute the arc length, that's exactly equal to the evolution time. So that sounds like a, a simple statement, but actually it's very powerful because you know, ultimately what I want to do is I want to cancel noise. And if I want to cancel first order noise, I need this error curve to come back to the origin at the final time. And so instead of picking different choices of omega and trying to figure out how, how to make that curve come back to the origin, I can turn the problem on its head and say, well, if I just draw a closed curve, then I can read off the pulse that implements that evolution by computing its curvature. And I'll know immediately how long that pulse is, how fast that gate is, by looking at the length of the curve I drew. So this gives me the entire solution of this problem. Like any pulse that cancels noise corresponds to a closed curve in two dimensions. And so I can just start drawing closed curves on a plane and in that way derive new pulses that cancel noise while implementing different gate operations. So here's a simple example of a, a nice smooth closed curve. So one, one way you can uh, write down formulas for these kinds of curves is to borrow the, all these different lemnus gates that various 19th century mathematicians were very fond of. Lemnus gate just means figure eight. So if I take one of these lemnus gates and chop it in half, I get a nice closed curve. And by computing the curvature at each point, I can extract the driving pulse that corresponds to the pulse that implements this evolution. Since the curve is closed, the, the error to first order is going to be canceled. Now, an additional fact that falls out of this connection between um, geometric curves and quantum evolution is that the opening angle at the origin is directly related to the operation that's performed on the qubit, the target operation. So for the particular Hamiltonian I'm talking about here, where I have driving along the x-axis, if there's no noise, then I'm just doing x rotations. And so that opening angle at the origin is telling me the angle of rotation about the x-axis that I'm performing. And so if I want to do different gates, I just have to draw curves with different opening angles at the origin. Here I show four different examples and the corresponding pulses. So this is the totally general solution to this dynamical decoupling problem for this two-level Hamiltonian at least. And so I should be able to understand all the previous results from NMR in this language, and I can. So for example, if I think about spin echo, so spin echo we said is just a single delta function pi pulse halfway through the evolution. So in terms of a curve, what this means is that I start at the origin. Initially, I, straight, I trace a straight line because initially there is no pulse. No pulse means no curvature. No curvature means straight line. And then when I reach the top here, this is where the delta function comes in. I turn around infinitely fast and just retrace afterward the same line back to the origin. So at the point where I turn around infinitely fast, the curvature is infinite, and that gives me a delta function pulse. And then the second half of the evolution, again, there's no pulse. And so I just follow the same straight line back down to the origin. And since I stop at the origin, I'm guaranteed that the noise is canceled. So the same sort of uh, picture holds for any other dynamical decoupling sequence based on delta function pulses. 
For example, if I look at CPMG, this corresponds to starting now in the middle here, which is my origin. And now I go up half this line segment. I turn around infinitely fast. That gives me a delta function at that point. And then I go all the way down to the bottom of the segment here. I again turn around infinitely fast. It gives me the second delta function in my pulse sequence and so on. And I can go up and down as many times as I like. So long as at the end I stop at the middle, I'm guaranteed that my pulse sequence is going to cancel the noise. So this can be used to derive Hans Beneko, CPMG, or dynamical decoupling sequences, any sequence based on delta function pi pulses. And not just all the ones that are already known from NMR, but you can derive infinitely many more just by you know, going up and down this line some number of times and just ensuring that you stop in the middle at the end. But more generally, the full solution space is not just curves on a line, it's curves on a two-dimensional plane. And if I expand my curves out into the 2D plane, I can get nice smooth pulse shapes that do the same thing without having to go to infinite amplitude or infinite, infinitely fast rise times and so on. So this is the general solution to the problem as it pertains to this particular qubit Hamiltonian. And this is just talking about canceling first order noise so far. Then I can ask, okay, what happens if I wanna cancel second order noise? Now, if we go to that same perturbation expansion of the evolution operator and look at the second order noise coefficient, you can show that it's proportional to the area enclosed by the curve. So what that means is that if I want to also cancel second order noise, I need to draw a closed curve that has zero enclosed area. So I could do that by drawing a figure eight shape like this, where I start at the origin, I go counterclockwise in the upper half plane, and then clockwise in the lower half plane, and then I come back to the origin, canceling first order noise. Because these two lobes of the figure eight have the same area and a relative sign due to the fact that in the upper half, I'm going counterclockwise and the lower half, I'm going clockwise, the overall area enclosed by this curve is zero. So this will cancel second order as well. And so I have three other examples here for three other figure eight shapes that cancel noise to second order. But you can see that for these figure eights, the opening angle at the origin is always pi, which means I'm always doing an identity operation on my qubit for these very symmetric curves. If I want to do a different operation, then I need to break the symmetry a bit in my curve. But so long as I still draw a curve that has uh, zero net area and is closed, then I can still cancel noise to second order. So these are four different examples of curves that have the, those properties, but they have four different opening angles at the origin, meaning that they implement four different types of X rotations. And it's easy to see, I can get any X rotation I want just by changing the, the curve a little bit. And then you can go on and show that if you want to cancel third order noise, there's a certain signed volume that lives over this curve in the plane that has to vanish. Uh, similarly for fourth order noise, if you want to cancel beyond fourth order, then nobody knows what exactly the geometric criterion is that has to be satisfied. But in practice, in almost every qubit platform, stopping at second order is sufficient. If your qubit really requires you to go beyond second order, then probably the qubit has other issues as well. And it might not be worth trying to, to improve the control that well. So as a quick example of this formalism, we can think about the landau zener problem. So this is a problem where I have an energy spectrum that has an avoided crossing somewhere in it. Let's just think about a two-level system for simplicity. And imagine the case that this avoided crossing is um, a result of some noise parameter epsilon representing a coupling between my qubit and its environment. And usually the goals in landau zener physics are to either start on one side in the ground state and try to um, traverse the gap and end up on the ground state on the far side. That's one standard procedure that people want to implement. Or you can try to use the avoided crossing to perform a gate operation. You can start here, bring in your system close to the avoided crossing, accumulate some phase, and then bring it back. So noise in the avoided crossing can degrade these different operations. And so can we apply this formalism to, to counteract that effect? Um, before I say a bit how you can do that, it's interesting to just look at linear driving uh, in this geometric language. So the landau zener problem, of course, in the original version of it, they considered an omega of t that was linear in time with some velocity, uh, some slope, the landau zener velocity v. And so the driving profile in this case is just this linearly increasing ramp. If you map this onto a curve, it turns into the so-called Euler spiral, where you start in one spiral, come outward, and then wrap around and come back to this other spiral and goes and you go inward. Uh, 
And as time goes to infinity, you just go, you just keep zooming and zooming in at that point. Uh, interestingly, this, uh, this shape appears in a number of different branches of mathematics. So for example, there's some recent works studying Euler spirals in, in various shapes. If you take, for example, an orange like this and peel it uniformly um, and lay out the peel on a surface, it's going to form an Euler spiral in the limit where the peel is infinitely thin. So that's just a fun fact. So using this uh, connection with, uh, to geometry, we, we actually proved that it's impossible to cancel noise using a monotonic pulse. So if you're trying to sweep your system through um, an avoided crossing in the spectrum, then if you're sweeping monotonically, then it's impossible to cancel the noise. And you can actually show this rather straightforwardly by using this con connection to geometry. In particular, there's a theorem called the Tate-Messer nesting theorem, which guarantees that your, your curve cannot have a self-crossing uh, in this situation, in which case you cannot get a closed curve. Ed, may I ask you something? Please, yeah. Yeah, it's uh, really nomenclature. Uh -huh. uh, I I came out of this spiral like uh, in the 1960s, but I thought it was called Cornu spiral. Is this something different from Cornu spiral? Or? No, it's a, it's the same thing. It has two names for no good reason. Oh, did I see in optics is definitely called Cornu spiral. It's never called Euler spiral in in optics, right? Am I correct? I I've think so. So Euler spiral. But I have done a lot with this in my teenage years. Teenage years. Yeah, so, so it's exactly the same thing as the Cornu spiral. I think Cornu is usually used in the context of engineering and Euler in the context of math. Okay, all right, thanks. Okay. I yeah. thought, so it's nothing different. It's not like Cornu spiral is not a special place of Euler spiral or anything. No, 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 it's exactly the same thing. Yeah. All right, thanks. Yeah, so then if we want to design a Landau's inner sweep that brings us through the avoided crossing while canceling noise at the same time, then we can use this geometric formalism to do that. So here I'm, I'm showing two different curves, one where we, we geometrically engineer a closed curve that has zero enclosed area by taking a piece of this Euler or Cornu spiral, which is this half of this figure eight. And then we add to it two semicircles, one here and one there to form this closed loop that has zero net area. And then for comparison, I'm also including here this orange curve, which is just the same piece of uh, Euler spiral, which is clearly not closed. So that would just correspond to a naive linear ramp, like it was originally considered by Landau and Zener and, and others. And so if I translate, if I compute the curvatures of these curves, I end up with these two different pulse profiles. So the orange one is just this linear ramp, but the geometrically engineered one has first this constant piece corresponding to one of these semicircles, since it's a circle that has constant curvature, and so it's a constant pulse. And then it has this linear ramp from the Euler spiral piece. And then the second semicircle gives me another constant uh, pulse profile. So altogether, I bring the system from the left of the avoided crossing to the right. Um, but I see that by using this non-monotonic uh, variation in the pulse, I can also cancel noise, in this case, the second order at the same time. And then I can confirm that just by computing the infidelity as a function of the noise strength. So that's an example of how we can apply this kind of formalism. So an, an interesting point that I mentioned earlier is that you know, not only can I extract the, the pulse from the curvature, but it also turns out that the evolution time or the gate time is exactly equal to the arc length of the curve. And this provides a really powerful way to understand some interesting things. For example, there's this notion of quantum speed limit, which says that there's a, there's a finite time it takes to rotate some state to another state or to perform some gate operation. And, and you cannot, exceed that just um, without violating the principles of quantum mechanics. And so what that means here is that we can get kind of a global view of, of understanding what is the absolutely fastest possible gate operation I can, I can apply that simultaneously cancels noise. So since the, the gate time is just equal to the arc length, the obvious thing I could do is just take my curve and shrink it. That's going to preserve the, the gate operation I do but it's also going to increase the pulse amplitude because the pulse amplitude is the curvature and the curvature grows as I shrink my curve. And so if I keep shrinking the curve, I'm going to start violating what, what can be done in the experiment. And so really I should impose some upper bound on the, on the curvature, which translates to an upper bound on the pulse amplitude. So I'm really interested in knowing what is the shortest possible curve I can construct that's closed, implements the operation I want, um, while without violating this constraint on the curvature. So this is a nice uh, example of a variational calculus type problem. 
So I can write down a Lagrangian where the goal is to reduce the length of the curve, which is the first term here. But then I can include some Lagrange multipliers and slack variables to impose the other conditions. You know, for example, that I not violate this pulse amplitude constraint, which is imposed by the experiment I'm interested in. So I can write down the Lagrangian. I can, I can work out the Euler-Lagrange equations for this. And it turns out that they're totally trivial. These solutions are made up of straight lines and circular arcs of radius one. So that just means that uh, radius one just means I'm saturating my pulse amplitude constraint. So then the, the task is to figure out how I can piece together these basic components coming out of the Euler-Lagrange equations, these straight lines and circular arcs, such that I form a closed loop and so cancel the noise. The shortest closed loops I can form out of these ingredients, uh, there are three possibilities and they each contain three segments. So one is I have a straight line followed by a circular arc followed by a straight line, or I can have a straight line followed by two circular arcs, or I can make also a closed curve out of three circular arcs pieced together. So once I've identified these possibilities, I can then ask, okay, which one is the absolute shortest for a given target gate operation? And it turns out that the third one is always the shortest no matter what rotation I'm interested in performing. So by taking these three circular arc pieces and, and gluing them together to form a closed loop, and then I compute the curvature of that, that gives me the globally optimal dynamically corrected gate for this single qubit problem. And you can see that the, basically what you do is you, you maximize the amplitude at a negative value initially, then you ramp up to a positive value and again, saturate the pulse amplitude constraint and then bring it back down to zero. So this is kind of a, a standard example of what's called bang-bang type protocols from quantum um, optimal control theory. And <clears throat> so this is canceling first order noise. I can do the same type of analysis, also including the second order noise cancellation constraint, but just by adding uh, another Lagrange multiplier to my Lagrangian. Again, and again, I can compute the solutions to the Euler-Lagrange equation, which are Again, trivial, they're just made up of straight lines and circular arcs, nothing's really changed. And this time, the shortest possible curve that satisfies all these conditions is made up of five circular arcs, like shown here. So then this translates into a five part square pulse composite. And so <clears throat> for whatever target rotation I want to do, I can easily write down formulas for the different uh, time durations of each of these constant segments. And so I can find the globally optimal solution for any target operation. Now, I, I started this talk by saying that I don't like square pulses and I don't like delta functions. Here's a square pulse sequence. It's the globally optimal solution. That's just a mathematical statement. I can't really do anything about that. If I'm really interested in smooth pulses at the end, which I'm always going to be if I want to do quantum computing, then I need to, I need to find a way to translate these square pulses into something that's nice and smooth. There are two different ways I can imagine doing this. So there's the naive way, which is the green curve here, where I just take my five part square pulse sequence and try to smoothen it using some recipe. That does okay. If I compute the error as a function of noise strength, it's not terrible, but I can do much better if I go back to my geometric curve and somehow modify the curve itself to make sure that the pulse that comes out is nice and smooth. And that's, that corresponds to this red pulse here. And you can see that it introduces some additional wiggles, but actually if I compute the error as a function of noise strength, now I do much better up to an order of magnitude or more better than just smoothening out the, the pulse itself. And the reason for that is because if I'm tinkering with the curve directly, then I'm, it's easier to guarantee that I'm still, I'm not violating my noise cancellation conditions. I can modify my curve and still maintain the zero um, area condition and the, and the closed curve condition pretty well. And that's much harder to do if, I'm, if I start with the square pulse and try to smoothen it out. So that's why this approach seems to be better. Okay, so I've shown you um, the general solution for the simple case where I have a single qubit Hamiltonian where this detuning parameter delta was set to zero. So now what happens if I reinstate this constant delta to some non-zero, and it's, it's a known constant value. So pretty much any uh, qubit Hamiltonian can be written in this form. And so now the question is, how does the procedure work? What changes in this case? Um, and let's just focus for simplicity on this uh, detuning noise like we had before epsilon, just to keep things as simple as possible. <clears throat> 
So the first immediate qualitative change that happens compared to before is that now I can no longer solve the Schrodinger equation even in the absence of noise. If I set epsilon to zero, then I have a, a Hamiltonian with omega of t on the off diagonals and this constant delta on the diagonal. If omega t is totally arbitrary, I can't solve this Schrodinger equation analytically. That's a, it's the simplest quantum dynamics problem that exists and it's well known that there's no general solution. So what can I do in this case? So fortunately, this, um, this Schrodinger equation is an example of a one-way problem, meaning that if I'm given the Hamiltonian and I'm asked to find the evolution operator, this is a hard problem in general. But if, I'm at, if I go the other way and I'm, I'm given the evolution operator, it's trivial to find the corresponding Hamiltonian that generates it because I can just solve the Schrodinger equation for the Hamiltonian and read it off if, I'm, if I know what u is. So in that sense, it's a one-way problem. And it shows me that my geometric approach is basically doing the second version here, because when I draw a curve, I'm effectively determining what the evolution is, and then I'm extracting the Hamiltonian by computing its curvature. And so even though I cannot solve the Schrodinger equation, even in the absence of noise in this more general case, it doesn't actually matter in the end. I can still set up a geometric formalism and, and extract new dynamically corrected gates. So in particular, I can still take my evolution operator and do a perturbation series expansion. Now my zeroth order solution U0 is unknown in general, but it doesn't stop me from writing down this expansion. And I can see at first order, I have this integral involving U0 and some constant matrix just to poly Z. And if I want, I, I can just recognize that this integral is a Hermitian matrix, which I can parameterize in terms of three real functions, which I'm going to call Rx, Ry, and Rz for a reason that's gonna become clear in a second. And I can see that you know, what I want to achieve is if I want to cancel leading order noise, then I need to make sure that this integral vanishes at the final time. And so that means that each of these functions, rx, ry, and rz, all have to vanish at the final time. So I can assemble these three functions into a real vector that lives in three-dimensional Euclidean space. And so then the task is basically uh, the same as what we had before. In order to cancel noise to first order, I need a closed curve. Now, the difference is that because I have a non-zero detuning, my curve lives in three dimensions instead of two. But the basic idea is the same. Now, a curve in three dimensions, so a curve in two dimensions we saw is characterized by one real function, which is the curvature. A curve in three dimensions is characterized by two functions, the curvature and something else called the torsion. And the curvature describes the amount of bend in, in the curve which is kind of intuitive. The torsion is a measure of how much the curve is bending out of a plane at each point, where the plane is spanned by the tangent vector and the curvature vector. I can compute both of these quantities, the curvature and the torsion, using standard formulas from differential geometry. Not surprisingly, the curvature ends up being, again, just the driving field omega t, like we saw in the planar case. Interestingly, interestingly the torsion turns out to be exactly equal to the detuning. So when I write down a Hamiltonian like this with some driving field and some detuning parameter delta, I instantly have this geometric interpretation where omega of a t is the curvature, delta is the torsion. And I can view the quantum evolution as this curve in three dimensions. So the basic idea is the same. If I want to find a pulse that cancels noise to first order, I need to draw a closed curve now in three dimensions. And by extracting the curvature and the torsion, I can find the driving fields that implement that evolution. And the target operation is again encoded now in the initial and final tangent vectors, their relative orientation. So it's kind of a straightforward generalization of this opening angle at the origin we talked about in the planar case. The second order noise cancellation becomes a little bit more complicated. Now, if I draw a closed curve in three dimensions, the condition is that when I look at the shadows along three orthogonal directions, I need each of these shadows to have zero area. So this is a generalization of the planar condition where I needed the area of the curve itself to be zero. Now I have these three shadows. But I can systematically find curves that have these properties and extract the driving fields from them. So one additional complication that arises when I switch on the detuning is that I might have additional constraints that the curves have to obey depending on what the, uh, the properties of my physical system are. So for example, if I'm driving a qubit with some pulse amplitude omega of t and some detuning parameter delta, 
then it might be the case that I can't actually change delta in time. And so I'm not looking for general curves in three dimensions. I'm looking for curves that have constant torsion in that case. And so then I need to find a systematic way to impose this constant torsion condition so that I can find three-dimensional curves that correspond to physical evolutions of my qubit. And so Faye Zhuang in our group, she came up with a general scheme to do this where you start, I'm not gonna get into the details, but the basic idea is that you start by drawing a curve on a plane that satisfies certain symmetry conditions. And then by projecting this curve onto a sphere, you end up with a curve that's called the binormal. And from the binormal B, you can construct the curve itself, R of T, by doing this integral. And so you can, so this is a systematic procedure to start from plane curves with certain rotational symmetries that allows you to generate closed curves with constant torsion in three dimensions. So this is actually an, kind of an open area in mathematics and we're, uh, I think, contributing to that community as well by, by deriving these uh, formulas. So constant, uh, unlike constant curvature, it's a bit hard to visualize, at least for myself, constant torsion. Um, but here's an example of a constant torsion curve that you can construct. And these are the corresponding, uh, this is the corresponding pulse in this case. Now, another important application I wanted to mention is that we can, in addition to deriving new examples of pulses, we can also take our formalism and use it to understand properties of pulses that are obtained using other means. So for example, if pulses are generated using GRAPE or some other numerical algorithm uh, that's very popular, then we can take those pulses and analyze them geometrically to understand to what extent are they canceling noise along various directions. And so we did this in collaboration with Andrew Zurek's group who works with uh, spin qubits and silicon quantum dots where they had generated a series of single qubit gates uh, using the GRAPE algorithm. And we took uh, uh, several of their examples and we, and we constructed the corresponding curves in three dimensions in each case. And then we can see to what extent is the curve closed and to what extent does it satisfy this, the zero area cancellation condition. And in most cases, we can see that the second order noise is being canceled reasonably well, although there are some examples, like for example, example here for this Z gate, where you can see that this shadow clearly does not have zero area. And so we can identify, okay, th and this particular aspect of the second order noise is not being canceled. So then we can imagine constructing a feedback loop where we update the pulse to correct this, this issue. So this is a second way in which this uh, geometric formalism can be used to, to assist with numerical or other kinds of recipes for generating control fields. So I've been focusing primarily on a single cubic gate to try to keep things as simple as possible. Um, but uh, all of this stuff extends to arbitrarily many levels or arbitrarily many qubits. Um, the main thing that changes now is that we're talking about curves in higher dimensions. And the key to figuring out how this geometric formalism works in higher dimensions is to make use of what's called the frenet saray equations or the frenet saray frame. So the basic idea is that I can define a space curve in any number of dimensions by defining a set of orthonormal vectors, some frame, and by lo looking at how these orthonormal vectors evolve as I move along the curve. So if I know how the vectors evolve, I can reconstruct the curve completely. So in three dimensions, which is what I'm depicting here, I would have the, the tangent vector, which is this E sub T, which points tangentially to the curve, of course. There's the normal vector, which points in the direction where the curve is bending. And then there's a vector that's orthogonal to both of these, which is called the binormal vector. But if I look at curves in higher dimensions, I'll just add more and more uh, vectors to this frame. And if I then write down the frenet saray equations, which are a simple set of equations that you can derive trivially but just by thinking about orthonormal vectors. Uh, these equations dictate how these uh, different vectors evolve along the curve. And the way in which they evolve depends on these generalized curvatures, which I call kappa here. And the number of these curvatures is equal to the dimension in which the curve lives minus one. So if I have a curve in three dimensions, there are two such generalized curvatures, and those are what I call the curvature and the torsion. So the key to figuring out this geometric formalism in higher dimensions is to understand how can we relate this frenet saray equation to a given Hamiltonian. So in collaboration with uh, Shankar and his student Donovan Budarakos, we worked out this um, general 
uh, mapping between qubits and curvatures. Uh, we consider the case with a single error term in the Hamiltonian for simplicity. And so the basic idea is that you can construct a set of vectors based on the Hamiltonian that exactly satisfy a set of equations which, which can be identified with the Fermat Surrey equations. And then this allows you to construct a recursion relation which tells you how to read off the generalized curvatures from the various terms in the Hamiltonian. I'm not going to get into the nitty gritty mathematical details. It gets a little bit laborious here, but the basic idea hopefully is clear. And so to demonstrate this idea, we looked at a simple two qubitic Hamiltonian example that's relevant both for transmon qubits and the dispersive regime and also capacitively coupled single triplet spin qubits, where you can basically write down the Hamiltonian as you know, single qubit terms plus an icing like ZZ interaction between them. And in this case, we considered driving one qubit only. And so this two qubit Hamiltonian, if you write it out as a matrix, has this block diagonal structure to it. And we also consider the case where we had dephasing noise on one of the qubits. And so the question is, how can we design two qubit gates that counteract this noise? If you take this Hamiltonian and compute the generalized curvatures, it turns out that there are five of them, which means that our curve, the curve uh, describing this uh, two qubit evolution lives in six dimensions. So it is it's actually not too hard to construct closed curves in six dimensions if you spend a little bit of time thinking about it. But in this particular case, we can use a shortcut and notice that because our Hamiltonian has this block diagonal structure, we can actually factorize this six dimensional curve into two three dimensional curves. And so this allows us to simplify the problem a little bit, at least it's certainly easy, easier to visualize what's going on in this case. And you can see that the two curves in question have to have the same curvature because I have the same driving field in both of the blocks here, but they have different torsion because I have an E2 here and an E1 there and E1 and E2 are generally different. So Donovan uh, figured out a systematic way to construct a pair of curves that have the same curvature, but different torsions. Um, uh, one way you can do this is to, first of all, notice that a curve of constant curvature and constant torsion is a helix, a spring. And so if you want to create a constant torsion curve, one thing you can do is to take different springs and glue them together to form a closed curve. So that's what Donovan did here in this example. So here are two um, closed curves constructed by, by piecing together some springs. And this is the corresponding pulse sequence extracted from the curvature of these. Uh, but Donovan was also able to show that you can take each of these spring pieces forming these closed curves and, and smoothen them out in a way um, that allows you to maintain the constant torsion condition, but while getting away from this constant curvature condition. So then you can end up with a, a corresponding pulse, which is nice and smooth instead of this square pulse sequence here. So this particular example was designed to do a single qubit gate and an always on coupling two qubit system while canceling noise at the same time. Um, but you could, we also showed that you can perform entangling gates uh, using a similar procedure. So I also wanted to mention in, in the last uh, part of the talk here, um, what happens to this construction if you want to go beyond having a single noise source. So, so far I've been focused on the case where we have noise on the detuning parameter, but oftentimes it's, the situa it's also the case that we have noise in the driving field itself. So for example, if we're thinking about singlet triplet spin qubits where the driving field is the exchange coupling between the two electron spins. If I have charge noise in the system that leads to fluctuations in this exchange coupling, which means, which effectively looks like fluctuations in my driving field amplitude. And so how can I cancel this type, type of noise at the same time? So this is actually something I thought about a few years ago before all of this uh, geometric stuff I've shown you here. And I was able to derive a set of constraints that cancel both kinds of noise at the same time, but it turned out to be kind of challenging to solve those constraints in practice, at least while maintaining, uh, well, um, and, and getting smooth pulses that are experimentally feasible. Although I should mention that there's been some work by Utkan van Gordu and Jason Kessner recently that have uh, surpassed some of those difficulties. So can we extend this space curve approach I've been showing you to include pulse error suppression at the same time? Um, there has been some work by Robert Throck Morton and Shankar on this problem where they showed that in order to cancel control field noise at the same time, you either need nonlinear errors in your control field, errors that depend on the control field itself in some nonlinear way, 
or you might need to, you, you probably have to have a two axis control instead, meaning that you cannot set the detuning parameter to zero. It has to be something non zero. So then with that result in mind, I consider a Hamiltonian like this, where I have noise in my detuning parameter and noise fluctuations in my driving field. Here, I, I take them to be linear. And the question is, can I, can I find driving fields that will cancel the noise at least a first order uh, for both of these noise sources? Now, it turns out that it's a little bit easier to consider a slightly more general Hamiltonian where I allow driving along all three axes instead of just two. So here I'm going to allow, uh, just to keep the discussion simpler, I'm going to allow this detuning parameter to depend on time. And also I'm going to introduce this third driving field phi of t, which, so this would describe the most general two qubit Hamiltonian I can possibly think of subject to both detuning noise and driving field noise. Now, the idea that we had was to borrow ideas from holonomic gates. So this is, so holonomic gates is an idea that's been around for at least two decades now. The basic idea is that you want to do a gate operation where the rotation angle is determined by a geometric phase, uh, similar to the Berry phase, although here we don't make any assumptions about adiabaticity. And the idea is that since the rotation angle only depends on the trajectory traced on the block sphere, then if the noise is such that it only speeds up or slows down the evolution along the trajectory without actually deforming the path itself, then this uh, gate operation is intrinsically robust to the noise. And oftentimes it can be the case that control field noise will basically just do that. It will accelerate or decelerate the evolution along the trajectory without messing up the trajectory. And so this, is, this approach is sort of natural for dealing with that kind of noise. But the problem with holonomic gates is that they typically are not designed to also cancel transverse noise like I talked about for the, the bulk of the talk. And you can see that by taking a standard so-called orange slice model holonomic gate, where you basically just construct an evolution on the block sphere, which is comprised of two great arcs that have a relative angle between them. And so this, so the rotation angle you end up with is just the solid angle enclosed by this path. If you take this evolution and map it onto one of my space curves, you find that it's an open thing. And so it doesn't actually cancel the leading order error due to transverse noise. And so the question for us was, can we find a way to generate evolutions that are both holonomic and correspond to closed space curves? And so the solution to this was uh, found by another student in our group, Wen Cheng Dong, who's uh, going to be moving on to Dartmouth soon to work with Lorenzo Viola. And what he showed is that for every closed, smooth, three-dimensional space curve, there is a unique holonomic trajectory. And then he went on to construct a family of curves that have a continuous uh, parameter that can be tuned to allow you to do any gate operation you want, essentially. So you can tune the rotation angle of your gate operation by twisting these curves. So you start with some curve here, which is nearly living in a plane. And then by turning on a certain twist operation, you bend the curve in various ways and you can maintain the holonomic uh, evolution condition uh, at the same time. So you're still canceling control field noise. And since the curve remains closed, you're also canceling transverse noise, but you get different gate operations as a result. And now essentially the way in which you extract holonomic evolution from these kinds of curves is to modify a bit the recipe for extracting the curvature and the torsion and so on. So now the driving fields in my Hamiltonian are not going to be exactly just the curvature and the torsion. I'm going to use modified formulas in which all three driving fields in my most general qubit Hamiltonian are non-zero. And so for this particular uh, example here, I can extract the omega of t, the phi of t, and the delta of t using some set of formulas, which I didn't include on the slide. Um, and then once I have these control fields, I can then test the performance against uh, more naive holonomic gates like this standard orange slice model by looking at the fidelity as a function of the noise strength. And these uh, doubly geometric gates, as we call them, or dog gates, clearly do much better since they're also canceling transverse noise at the same time. So I find, what I find particularly interesting about this result is not only is it uh, very useful for, for real quantum systems where multiple types of noise are usually present, but also I like this connection between closed space curves and holonomic, traject and holonomic geometries or trajectories, which I don't think was, was appreciated prior to this work. Okay, in the last couple of minutes, I just wanted to mention another extension of this idea 
this time moving away from quasi-static noise, which has uh, been the assumption throughout the talk so far, and thinking about the more realistic, realistic case where the noise is time dependent. So in most uh, solid state qubit platforms like spins and quantum dots and superconducting qubits, the noise has a real time dependence, which is typically like one over the frequency to some power, whether it's from charge noise or nuclear spin noise or something else, that's, that's the case. And so the bulk of the noise is still concentrated at very low frequencies. But the, the fact that there's a tail in frequency space on the noise does ultimately matter for reaching very high fidelities, in particular for reaching quantum error correction thresholds in practice. And so while the quasi-static noise model allows us to, to kill the bulk of the noise, killing at least part of that tail is also going to be important, which is what the point of this work is. So you, by combining this geometric approach with the idea of filter functions, which are functions that allow you to understand the effect of control fields on your qubit in the presence of noise, um, we were able to show that we can systematically uh, construct pulses that cancel time-dependent noise. And connecting to the geometric side of things, one way you can understand how these pulses work is that in order to cancel the noise up to some, so the, constant, so the noise we assume is concentrated at low frequencies, and we're interested in canceling powers of the frequency away from zero. So we can relate the coefficient of the omega to the first power to a closed curve. And then we can relate the coefficient of the omega squared term uh, to another closed curve. And these curves are related by differentiation. And so if I want to flatten out the filter function to some power and frequency, that corresponds to finding a sequence of closed curves that are related by, different, by derivatives. And so here's an example of a, a four curve sequence like this, which will cancel, uh, which will suppress the noise, the filter function up to the, the third power. And so by flattening out the filter function, we're effectively desensitizing the qubit to low frequency noise. And so here are the corresponding curves and the pulses that come out from, from this particular example. And then we can also systematically construct pulses that, that suppress the filter function to arbitrarily high orders in frequency. This is going up to eighth order. In this case, these are different pulses that cancel up to eighth order. And you can see the corresponding filter functions down here where you can see that they're becoming incredibly small as you go to low frequency. So this um, business of drawing closed curves to cancel noise can be extended to time-dependent noise is the bottom line, but this time now you need a family of closed curves in order to make it work. Uh, so with that, I think I'll basically stop here. I'll just summarize by noting again this interesting connection between robust gates and closed curves. Uh, I'm more generally interested in this, this connection between um, quantum evolution and differential geometry, which I think has a, a lot of different interesting directions that, in which to go beyond just canceling noise and quantum uh, gates. Um, the geometry gives us a global view of the optimal control space, which is something uh, I think is kind of unique that it's really hard to achieve using any other approach, whether it's group theory or numerical recipes certainly don't really achieve that in general. And so I think even for larger systems where numerics might be inevitable because of the complications, all the complexity of the problem, I think having this global view and having an understanding of what is the quantum speed limit in this system, what can I expect to find using numerics and what are the optimal solutions in that space? I think this could be tremendously helpful for that. And especially since it works for multi-qubit systems and the, and the presence of multiple noise sources, I, I think it's gonna be a, a very powerful tool in that regard. And so I wanted to mention that if you're interested in learning more about the stuff I talked about, I have a, we have a recent review article that's on the archive. You can take a look at, and I'll stop here. Okay, thank you for a very interesting and nice talk. And now it's open to questions. I had a uh, quick question. Um, this is uh, Robert. Um, so I was wondering, um, in the case where you have, you know, the three-dimensional uh, curves, um, where you're able to, you know, do rotations about any axis, um, is there a geometric interpret or like some feature of the uh, curve that uh, tells you like the uh, angle of rotation and I presume like which axis the uh, rotation is being performed? about? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so a, a general unitary for a, a single qubit has three real parameters that describe it. Two of those parameters are fixed by the relative orientation of the initial and final tangent vectors of the curve. Ah, okay, so okay, so I guess it's probably like the, uh, and probably the angle between them tells you the angle of rotation then I assume? So that's part of it. So two of the parameters are fixed by just looking at the initial and final tangent vectors. 
Ah, so the, I see. the third parameter you get by integrating the torsion over the entire curve. So it's actually encoded non-locally in the curve. Ah, I see. Okay, yeah, yeah, sorry. I, yeah, I probably, uh, I may have missed uh, part of it. Like I had to step out for a little bit, so. No, it's actually good you asked. I don't think I really talked about that. So I'm glad you brought it okay. up. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Hi, I have a question. Uh, in the middle of the talk, or somewhere after the middle of the talk, you were speaking about uh, Fresnel ray frames in higher dimensional, and also in the 3D standard case, you were encountering situations where the torsion can be both positive and negative, as we know. And traditionally, the first curvature is uh, one uh, one sided, non negative. And does this have any impact on the way the omega field gets implemented? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. So it's true that usually in the differential geometry literature, people define the curvature to be strictly non-negative. Um, in order to map it to quantum evolution, we have to generalize that, that the relation slightly to allow for negative curvatures as well. But that's a fairly straightforward generalization that um, doesn't really change too much about the way that differential geometry works in this, in this case. So yeah, so here we, we, we work with a signed curve in, curvature no matter what the dimension is. So the signed curve is in the plane, right? Or is it also in 3D setting you're thinking of? Yeah, even in three dimensions or more dimensions than that, you can still define a signed curvature. Yeah, so this has something to do with what people in computer graphics call the Bishop frame uh, or natural frame. And uh, people in that area find this fact of arbitrary sign very helpful. I see. So you said that's called yeah. the Bishop frame? Bishop frame, named after R.L. Bishop in uh, for a differential geometer who passed away from Illinois. I see. Thanks. Yeah. I wasn't aware of that. So I'll have yeah. to look that up. OK. Ed, I have a quick question. Can you go to the figure? where you had this thing called dog carve and blue and orange slice. Mm -hmm. I think I was distracted. Uh, this blue carve, the dog gate, this is still a first order dynamical decoupling or is it somehow, I mean, I missed the technical part of it, or is it somehow treating the sec second order correction also? I mean, why is it so good is what I'm wondering. Yeah, this is only first order. So this is canceling first order and transverse noise while also implementing holonomic evolution, which partially cancels the control field noise. I see. So it's a, it's a very good implementation. So on that, then let me quickly ask a question which you and I have talked about, but I do not know if you're pursuing it. Now, the same formalism, we talked about it, I think, 10 years ago, same formalism can in principle be used to go to second order, right? It's just much, much more work, but it can be done, right? Yeah, I don't see why uh, it can't be done. Yeah, whether there is any advantage in doing it or not uh, is not clear. But if 20 students, you should be able to do it. Uh, are you doing it? I mean... Uh, this is this is good for the soul of the students doing this kind of hard work. Uh, so that particular that particular direction we're not pursuing at the moment. Um, mm -hmm. I don't think we have any plans to do that anytime soon either. The reason, yeah. But yeah, I think for most systems, I think going to second order is going to be necessary because I, I don't think the error levels are low enough that first order. That's exactly what I'm asking. Yeah. That to compare with let's say experiments, you have to. We should talk about it offline. I have some ideas. Okay. Okay. Yeah. That sounds good. Yeah. This is this needs to be done. Next step. It looks like everything else you have done. So all right. Thanks. I have one more question if there is time. Uh, it has to do with your application of the calculus of variations approach to solving problems way back when you were considering the uh, time optimal case or length optimal case. Uh, isn't it equally helpful and calculationally effective to work with the Pontryagin maximum principle approach? And have you considered it or used it in your own work? Uh, we haven't used it, at least not to begin with, but it seems like it kind of falls out in the results. So, you know, the, the final results seem to be totally consistent with that principle. Um, but yeah, we didn't use it as a starting point. Okay, I think we should move on now. Uh, so, uh, okay. Gane, can you try to share your screen? Okay, yeah, just once. Yeah, okay. Now uh, let me give you uh give a very short introduction. So our next speaker is uh Gane Chen from Caltech. 
and he's going to talk about quantum advantage and quantum chemistry. Okay, please go ahead. Okay, can you see it? Yeah, I can see a full screen. Okay, great. Yeah, sorry for the uh, slight delay. Is having I, I have some internet issues it seems today, but hopefully they'll hopefully the internet will stay up during this talk. Um, okay, so uh, firstly, let thanks for inviting me to be part of this, um, and uh, I'll say that uh, when I got this invitation, um, Sankar accompanied it by a couple of questions. Uh, one question was. What role does a digital quantum computer have in solving problems of quantum chemistry? Um, and the second question, which I paraphrase a little bit, is how will a quantum computer help with very practical questions, uh, for example, the drug and fertilizer industry? So I'll start off by saying that, you know, I'm a quantum chemist. Uh, my expertise is not in quantum computing and not even in quantum computing as applied to quantum chemistry. My expertise is really in the classical simulation of quantum many body systems, um, be they molecular or say material. Um, but nonetheless, uh, quantum computer science has in recent years defined quantum chemistry to be a major target application. Um, and so consequently, I think it's important for uh, quantum chemists to, uh, to be involved in this discussion and, and to give and to um, and to say something about this topic. And so that's the spirit in which uh, I'm going to approach this talk. So, um, so much of what I'm gonna say is, is not uh, perhaps new, but, um, but hopefully uh, I'm presenting these things in, in or putting together a sequence of things in a way that is perhaps uh, useful to people. Okay, so, um, so let me just say what I'm going to talk about. Okay, so so first um, I've got to really just tell you a little bit about quantum chemistry, and so I'll spend uh, some time on that. Uh, I'll talk about things that we can do and things that we cannot do today in quantum chemistry. Um, and then I'll also very briefly touch on um, touch on Sankar's questions about the uh, importance of solving quantum chemistry for industry. Um, and then finally, I will talk about uh, the question of quantum advantage uh, for quantum chemistry given um, quantum compute. Okay, so um, I'll first start off by saying that there's actually many um, areas where quantum mechanics is implied in, in molecular material science. And, and traditionally, quantum chemistry is actually only just one of them. Um, so. Uh, Quantum chemistry is usually, or, or I would say it was traditionally uh, used to refer to uh, the problem of solving for eigenstates of the electronic Schrodinger equation in molecules. Um, but of course, that's not the only sort of quantum mechanical phenomenon uh, that one needs to understand. So for example, if one is uh, doing, say, vibrational spectroscopy of a molecule, uh, then uh, the nuclei are moving. In that case, uh, you want to understand the eigenstates of the nuclear Schrodinger equation. Um, or you may want to have an experiment where you're not in an eigenstate at all, right? So for example, this might be a reaction. Uh, you need to consider the dynamics of the nuclei um, or perhaps even the electrons will be out of equilibrium. So, so quantum chemistry um, in sort of, you know, before quantum computing actually is only a, sub, you know, a subset of the applications of quantum mechanics to chemistry. Although I think in the quantum computing context, the term quantum chemistry actually refers to all these things. Um, there are, of course, um, analogs of these problems in, in materials domains. Um, so, uh, you know, there's the problem of solving the electronic Schrodinger equation in materials, which is very cl a very close relative of solving it in molecules. And there are, of course, uh, non-equilibrium problems in materials as well. Um, so, you know, for today's talk, I'm going to sort of restrict my discussion to what is more traditionally quantum chemistry and primarily focus on uh, solving for eigenstates of the electronic Schrodinger equation. Uh, in molecular material systems. So, you know, why has quantum simulation, I guess, become of interest in the area of, of quantum chemistry or what's its relevance to quantum chemistry? Well, I think, you know, some of it is due at, at least to uh, the famous 
a quote from Feynman, where he argued that essentially if one is simulating nature, um, one needs to make the simulation quantum mechanical. Now, and that's not by itself a very precise statement, but um, what is behind it is, I guess, the recognition that atoms and mo molecules are, of course, quantum mechanical objects. So in principle, they can encode states that embody quantum information. And so in principle, the amount of resources you would need, classical resources you would need to specify the quantum information uh, would grow exponentially with system size. So that's, of course, all true. Um, but there's, of course, another, there's a counterpoint to this argument, which is that, um, you know, people have been doing quantum chemistry and solving the Schrodinger equation for atoms and molecules for a long time, you know, for close to 100 years now. Um, and if it, indeed it were true that we had to wait until there was a quantum computer before we could actually say anything about atoms and molecules, we, we wouldn't even have chemistry itself. Um, and so trying to understand how quantum computers fit into this discussion is, is really resolving the, the tension between both of these statements, you know, which both of which are, are true. Okay, so, so to make some progress, let's just define quantum chemistry a little bit more carefully. Um, and as I said, I'm going to define as domain which deals with eigenstates of the electronic Schrodinger equation. Um, so the electronic Schrodinger equation looks like this. Um, so it's just some standard Hamiltonian. Uh, the, the operator parts are, are from the electrons um, and the nucleus is, uh, the nuclei are assumed to essentially be fixed, fixed charges. And so they simply exert a, a external potential on the electrons. Um, and we are going to try and get some eigenstates and a representative eigenstate would be the ground state because most of the time you find matter in uh, you know, molecules and materials under ordinary conditions in or very close to the ground state. Now, what one has to do next uh, in, in most simulations is you have to discretize the problem. Um, and so we introduce a basis. Um, and in this context, the basis are typically called orbitals. And so once one has done that, then one has the Hamiltonian now written down with lots of matrix elements, which are these symbols here with lots and lots of indices where the indices go over uh, the orbitals. Now, of course, um, you know, if many of you here are, I'm not sure which discipline you're in, but if you say in more traditional theoretical dense matter physics, that of course obtaining eigenstates of, you know, Hamiltonian associated with electrons, I mean, it's all very similar. Um, I, I would say the, the main distinction between quantum chemistry and so quantitative quantum material science is simply that the, the focus in the problems is often a little bit different. So often in quantum chemistry, we focus on the less exotic physics um, and try and describe it a little bit more, more realistically and more quantitatively. Garnet, may I ask you a question right here on this simple slide? Sure. Uh, isn't one big difference between quantum chemistry and condensed matter physics is that we in condensed matter physics basically get away often doing almost nothing, meaning we have almost no quantitative constraint. And often I see papers which really, you know, are not only not quantitative, anti-quantitative. On the other hand, quantum chemistry numbers mean something, I thought, that they really should have some real meaning, or am I exaggerating? Um, yeah, I mean, I think that that would be a more extreme statement of me saying that we're doing with less exotic things and more quantitative things, I guess. Yeah, I mean, but, I just yeah. wanted to make sure. I mean, I know you're being polite, but I just wanted yeah. to make sure that we are saying the same thing. Okay. Uh, yes. Well, <laughs> yes, I think there's a spectrum, but we are, I think, coming from the same. Yeah, I think there is more, more, more demand on you to be, you know, very honest with numbers. And, and I like that very much. I wish we had a little bit of that. Anyway, thank you. Okay, great. Yes. Yes, well, I'll try and be very honest in this talk, as we, as we shall see. Um, so, um, so oftentimes, you know, in, in quantum chemistry, we like to um, talk about the different types of quantum chemistry problems. And we discuss them often in terms of the quantitative, uh, sorry, qualitative features of the eigenstates we get out. Now, of course, you don't know the eigenstate until you've computed it. But after you've done it for many, many systems, you know, after the after you know long period of time, you know that one one has some 
one can even have some understanding of what kind of eigenstates you might see in certain uh, chemical contexts ahead of time. But in any case, um, very roughly speaking, one can define the qualitative wave function structure and sort of classify into three categories. Uh, one would be the ones where the electrons sort of stay in their mean field states um, almost all the time. Um, and so we refer to this as really a single configuration or single reference type uh, solutions. They're very, very close to the mean field solutions, even when you put the interactions in. Then there are the cases where the interactions or whatever is going on in the chemistry does something interesting to take you out of uh, what looks like a simple mean field state. Um, and here one can make a distinction between cases where there are really a small number you know, uh, uh, of perhaps finite number of particles that um, live in these excited configurations and your wave functions are superposition of a small number of these configurations um, and cases where there's sort of an extensive degeneracy that you have to consider. So both of these are what we would call multi-reference situations um, and but these two settings are encountered in different uh, places. So, so to give you some of the chemical examples corresponding to these three scenarios, um, in most of biology there is not much quantum mechanics and so if you think about um, say a drug uh, going into just some receptor, then there are no chemical bonds that are formed in, in a typical drug. It's just kind of nestling in there and everything is described very well by mean field or, or single reference uh, physics with just some quantitative corrections from the interactions. Um, now, if you ha have a process where a chemical bond is formed or broken, um, a chemical bond or single bond is an entangled pair of electrons. Um, and so it's clear that there are at least sort of two contributions that these, you know, uh, for these are spin half particles. So there are at least sort of two states that contribute to the entangled pair. And so you have to consider at least a superposition of two different configurations, if not more. Um, and so that would be an example of a multi-reference problem, but where there's a small number of important configurations. Uh, and then finally, uh, one can go into problems that look a little bit more like, you know, the types of problems in uh, more complex condensed matter, where you have many magnetic centers. Um, in this case, there's many ways to couple the spins, there's many degeneracies, uh, many possible competing states, and here you have this type of uh, extensive multi-reference behavior. Um, a, a further feature um, that we have to think about in quantum chemistry um, is that because we want quantitative answers, in some sense, we're always solving a continuum problem or, or as, as close to a continuum problem as we can. Um, what I mean by this is that to get a good answer, the, the number of states one needs to consider, the number of orbitals one needs to consider is much, much larger typically uh, than the number of particles in the system. So to give an example of this, this is a, a small molecule, butadiene, and it has 30 electrons in it. Um, and one can discretize this molecule uh, at different levels, which I'm going to show in this table. So here are a different number of orbitals. Um, and then if one computes the excitation energy, which you measure say optically, but when computes this theoretically, uh, you see that you know, it changes as you in, in, increase the discretization. Um, and a, a reasonable number for resolving experiment would be to converge the second decimal place. Um, and so one sees here that one needs, you know, on the order of let's say 500 orbitals uh, to represent uh, the 30 electrons. So, you know, the system, you need many, many more basis functions typically than you have uh, particles in the system. Um, and in, in typical high accuracy calculations, one deals with hundreds or even thousands of orbitals uh, in the many body problem. Okay, so, um, so that's all of the setup. And then I'm going to show you a few slides just to show you, you know, some examples of things that we can do today. And then, and then I'll move on to things that we can't do. So first, let's start with um, some small molecules. Um, and here I'm going to take an example that was a benchmark problem done recently in this so-called Simons collaboration. Here we did a number of these diatomics that involve a transition metal and an oxygen atom. Um, and we used very large bases. Um, so if you simply enumerate the Hubert space, you, you'll see that the, the dimension is you know, astronomical, very large, 10 to the 44. Um, but nonetheless, uh, you know, the problems are not so complicated and so one can solve them very accurately. Um, and so here are the total energies from a variety of different methods. 
And this is just some type of color plot to show how well these methods agree. These three here are considered to be numer numerically nearly exact methods. And you see that these, the colors on the off diagonal are very dark. And this means that they agree very well. This is a logarithmic scale saying they agree to something like 10 to the minus three or 10 to the minus four atomic units. And so the nearly exact solutions can be achieved for these types of small systems. Um, to understand this in the context of experiments, um, here I show you not the total energy, but the ionization energy of the system. So the total energy is not something that can really be measured, but the energy to remove one particle, the ionization energy can. Um, and so here are three of the accurate methods. Um, they, they correspond to these red line, blue line, and this sort of green uh, strip. And you know they agree fairly well. And here are the experimental results. Um, from photoelectron spectroscopy, and they are these dots. And you notice the dots have you know, quite large errors with them. And in fact, there's a constant shift with time. Um, and so this just gives you an idea of the current state of the art that currently um, the best quantum chemistry methods for small molecules can solve things very precisely. And the uncertainty on the relative to the experimental scale is typically smaller than what you can achieve in the experiment. So, uh, Garnet, may I ask you some slightly questions or details on this slide, which is very interesting. Yes. For yeah. example, I see the word DMRG there. That's the only thing I understand. Sure. Uh, so, so uh, I mean, what is DMRG for a molecule? I mean, uh, what was it actually done? Can you just elaborate? Yes. Slightly? So it's, it's very similar to DMRG in the lattice model. It's just the Hamiltonian is very complicated. So okay. you just put your molecule all right, so you make it, make it a one dimensional thing. Now, yeah. how is it determined that your calculation, since it doesn't matter how many configurations you keep, yeah. the result is technically not exact because you have to keep infinite configurations. For yeah. that. So how yeah. do you decide? I hope it's not by how close to the experimental result it's going. I hope there is some theoretical criteria to choose uh, yes. to decide when the calculation ended. Can you elaborate a little bit on that also, please? Yes. Yeah. So it depends on the methods, right? So in DMRG, there is a, uh, a parameter, the bond dimension, which controls a number of right. variations. DMRG parameters. is fine, but some of yes. the other calculations. Yes. Um, OK, so I would just say that for these three of these methods, mm -hmm. uh, the, which are here, there is a parameter where if you increase it, eventually it should become exact. And so DMRG is one of them, SHCI is another, and SCI-QMC is another. Oh, OK. So, um, and in, in all three, the practitioners, increase the parameters. So I was one, but there's others obviously uh, in, increase the parameters to provide a prediction of what they believe was the exact result. Um, so and really this, can I understand in my language? So you have a parameter in the theory, which yes. defines a convergence criterion, then you increase the parameter yes. to get convergence in your computation. Is that what you're saying? Or yes. Saying? So, so this is, a, for example, SHCI is a different variational ansatz, mm -hmm. where you can increase the number of variational degrees of freedom, eventually it becomes exact. So here, um, Cyrus Umbrigar, who did this calculation, just kept increasing it until he was convinced it was converged um, and, similar, and then gave a prediction. And then with DMRG, which we did, we increased until we thought it was converged and gave a prediction. And then our two converged results agreed to oh, within wonderful. 10 to the minus four atomic. And, and is this SHCI, is it how many configurations one is keeping? Is that the number? Yeah. Yeah, so SHCI, yes, this is really just a linear combination of state okay, determinants and, and, it, and that, yeah, picked in a special way, but yes, it's just the total number at the end, which is the- conversion. Thank you very much. This is very helpful. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, so, so that's a small molecule. And so, and, you know, the, the type of uh, quality of electronic structure there is that it's very single reference in nature. So, uh, you know, most of the time the electrons are close to the mean field solution and they're quite, I mean, the mean field solution is not that accurate, but nonetheless, it's sort of the dominant piece of the wave function. And then, you know, all the quantitative corrections are where, you know, where the computation is going. But one can consider some more complicated chemistry. Um, and so here I take this system, which has become, for, for various reasons, become um, one that's discussed a lot in quantum computing, which is an nitrogenase system. Um, and, and here there are these, all these uh, clusters of, of iron and sulfur. So these are called iron sulfur clusters, and there's three. And um, there's a, an article from some years, years ago, which argued that, that studying this system is some type of important thing for quantum computers to do. Um, 
So it, it is indeed a, a problem of complicated electronic structure, uh, but nonetheless, you know, one can, one can attempt to do things with current classical methods. And so this is a calculation on the P cluster, which is the middle cluster here, um, using um, not a very good discretization of the problem. So this number of orbitals isn't sufficient to resolve the continuum nature of the physics, um, but it's enough to obtain some qualitative uh, insights. Um, and this problem is much harder because of the large amount of degeneracy. Um, so here are the DMRG energies as I'm increasing some convergence parameter and the, you know, there are more points on the curve which are not shown up here. Um, but nonetheless, one can see that the, 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 the um, accuracy that you can achieve is here 10 milliatomic units. So, so it's like 10 to the minus two. And then with some extrapolation, one can get to accuracies that on the scale of 10 to the minus three atomic units once again. So, I mean, not, it's not as accurate as for the small molecule, uh, but nonetheless, it is still uh, reasonably precise. And so even in quite complicated problems, uh, it's possible to obtain semi-quantitative insights at least. Um, and then finally, I just want to say there's nothing special about molecules. I mean, one can go to extended systems like crystalline materials. So this is, for example, uh, calcium copper oxide is a parent compound of at least some of the families of cuprates. Um, and an important parameter in the system is understanding its magnetic energy scales. And this is something that one can, I, I think, quite reliably compute today with many body quantum chemistry and other methods. So this is an example of the exchange couplings that one can derive from various forms of spectroscopy. Um, and here are some of the methods that we know are accurate in other quantum chemistry contexts. This is a type of quantum Monte Carlo um, result from Lucas Wagner some years ago. This is a yet another quantum chemistry method. Um, um, but one can indeed compute exchange couplings that are in reasonable agreement with each other and in reasonable agreement uh, with experiments in this case. Um, okay, um, now, so that's kind of a quick survey of, you know, things that, that we can do. Um, one natural question is, or is this limited, you know, I've shown you simulations of a certain size. So is all of this ultimately limited to some maximum size? And if I were to take the same problem and double the unit cell or make it or make the molecule twice as big or something like that, would everything that I said just, just broke down, just break down. So did I just pixel the, an optimal size to show you. Um, so, you know, one might um, be pessimistic just from so Feynman's statement that the amount of information is growing exponentially, um, but I, that, would, that, would be, that would normally be considered to be too pessimistic um, because, and because nature is in fact, as we know, really quite, quite local in, um, in, its, in its physics and chemistry. And so I just want to say, uh, uh, spend a couple of slides just saying a little bit about how locality manifests in quantum chemistry calculations and, and in the subject. Um, so in the late 80s and the early 90s, um, some quantum chemists, for example, one person was Peter Pulley, recognized that whatever quantum chemistry method you make, um, it will basically you can convert it into a method that scales linearly with system size if you build in the locality of the interactions uh, in the right way. Um, and the argument that he made at the time was sort of perturbative in nature because many quantum chemistry methods are somehow behind the scenes just adding up lots of diagrams. Um, but basically it went a little bit like this, which is that if you um, were to consider fluctuations just from uh, say some mean field starting point, uh, density density fluctuations say, uh, then you can, then the size of the, the correction to the energy from these density density fluctuations depends on the separation. Um, and it decays very quickly with the separation. These are sort of fluctuating dipoles. And so at second order, this, this correction decays like R to the minus six. And so if one is writing down these quantum chemistry methods that for example, start from mean field and then build in more and more complicated fluctuations, then so long as you introduce cutoffs into both the size of these density fluctuations and the, dis the separation between them, uh, then you will just get a linear scaling method. And then the only complexity is just implementing everything and making sure it all works uh, very efficiently. Um, and at a similar time, Walter Cohen made similar arguments calling this the nearsightedness of wave functions. So 
all of this is to say that for most of the techniques or many of the techniques I, I, I've talked about, there exist these linear scaling extensions. Um, and an example here is one of the methods I showed in the earlier slide with the couple cluster method. This was one of the methods used in the small molecule. But you can implement this building in these cutoffs and doing it in some very efficient way. Um, and nowadays, if you do this with a state-of-the-art implementation, um, you can use the same techniques used in small molecules, but on very large systems. And so this is a protein with 2,400 atoms. And um, for example, this is a very good implementation in the program called Orca by Frank Nieser's group. And one can sort of download this program and run the simulation uh, on your local cluster. Okay, so, um, so of course, you know, locality is also, uh, in, you know, has more fundamental uh, uh, expressions and in, in the condensed matter and quantum information setting, of course, we know that uh, with the development of DMRG and tensor networks and the understanding of things like area laws, uh, there are more sophisticated arguments which uh, make a case for locality in some non-perturbative way. And, you know, in modern quantum chemistry, these ideas are absorbed as well. But, but, the, but the sort of original local quantum chemistry was all derived from the sort of perturbative understanding of the effects of locality. Okay, so, so that's all making sort of a very positive case for what we can do. Um, and then the natural question you ask is, well, if that's really true, then why can't we just solve everything, right? So, so now let me just spend a couple of slides talking about things we can't do and the nature of which, the nature of things that means that we can't do things. Okay, so as a first case study, let's again go back to the nitrogenase problem. Um, and I pointed out that one can obtain quite accurate or semi-quantitative answers for a, you know, not very good discretization of the problem. So one where, you know, the number of orbitals is, is, is not very large compared to the number of electrons in the system. Now, if I wanted to make really a quantitative assessment uh, computation of the energy levels, I would have to increase the number of orbitals a lot. So perhaps let's increase it by an order of magnitude. This would, you know, presumably be much better and hopefully a sufficiently quantitative model. So what's the barrier to go from the current calculation with 676 orbitals to 760 orbitals? So the key thing is, you know, the barrier, we can sort of estimate it. Um, so um, there is empirical evidence to show that as we improve this discretization DMRG, just add more empty orbitals, that the, the complexity of the ansatz is roughly linear in the, as you just increase the number of orbitals, and then the cost of the calculation also depends just on how complicated the Hamiltonian is. Um, and so if I increase the number of autos by a factor of 10, if you carry out this argument, then roughly it would increase the calculation cost by a factor of 10 to the six. And so you would need to have a, a large increase in compu computer cost, um, assuming that you didn't think of any algorithmic improvements that, you know, for example, dealt with this continuum limit better. So this 10 to the six increase in computer cost is is large. I mean, these calculations we did with 76 all tools, you could do on, you know, a few hundred cores, if you needed to multiply that by a million, it would, you'd really need to use, you know, a very large part of a large supercomputer, but, um, but, um, but it's not an exponential increase in cost. Okay, so, so the bottlenecks are there. Um, they're not exponential. Um, they're all typically prefactors and very high polynomials, but, but nonetheless, they, they are barriers in practice. And that's why, for example, we can't currently today obtain quantitative predictions of the spectroscopy of nitrogenase. Um, a similar thing applies, for example, to the cuprates, right? So, uh, so why can't we just compute the phase diagram of the cuprates just like that, right? Well, in fact, if one takes a very simple model for the physics, like the Hubbard model, uh, then in fact, today there are methods which can say quite useful things about different parts of the phase diagram. So, so for example, if I were to just to take a tensor network like PEPS um, today for the TJ and, and, and 2D Hubbard model, at least in certain regimes, you can in fact obtain uh, very good results at zero temperature. Now in principle, going from the real material to this to the phase diagram is really just the problem of, of taking PEPs from the lattice into the continuum. Um, and that's not generally regarded as an exponentially hard problem, right? It's, it's viewed as one which in, introduces an enormous prefactor, uh, but one which is not exponentially hard. 
But nonetheless, the prefactor is very large. So, um, so there is work to go from lattice to continuum. For example, we have been working uh, in this direction, but it is still you know, really far from being able to do real materials. So, so the, 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 the take home message from the last two slides is that there are indeed many things we can't do. Um, sometimes it's due to large polynomial overhead. Sometimes it's due to very daunting prefactors, um, and, but they're not really exponential barriers. Uh, as far as I can tell. Okay, so, so that's sort of my overview of quantum chemistry and what we can do and what we can't do. And now sort of let me very briefly address Sankar's question about quantum chemistry uh, in industry. Um, so, you know, I'm not an industrial quantum chemist, uh, you know, I'm an academic, although, you know, I did co-found a startup which does try to do these things. It tries to use quantum chemistry to solve problems in industry. And so this is some, just a few words about you know, this setting. Um, so quantum chemistry is routinely used in industry. So it is actually a useful thing. Um, but if you ask how many quantum chemists are employed in a major chemical company, for example, it is not an enormous number, uh, no, maybe a dozen or so. And so, so it is, much smaller than the number of experimental chemists. Um, and, and the reason for this is not because we are not calculating enough digits of the Schrodinger equation. Um, it's because even if quantum chemistry were somehow exact and you solved everything polynomial cost, this would not eliminate the need for uh, experiments. Um, to, to understand this, you can just think about much of biology. So in much of biology, there's no, there's no, nothing quantum. Everything is just classical. And classical mechanics is something that you can simulate, exa simulate efficiently with polynomial cost. I mean, you know, solving Newton's equations is very, very cheap. Um, but that doesn't sort of obviate the need for experiments in biology, because not everything is just, not every question corresponds to the forwards problem of solving an equation, right? There are many problems that are, for example, just the inverse problem, which are not really addressed in this way. Um, there are also many types of simulations which aren't really related to, say, just the electronic Schrodinger equation itself. I mean, there are many questions which are to do with statistical mechanics, to do with fluid mechanics, and so on and so forth. And those are often the bottlenecks and not really just precisely determining the eigenstates of systems. Um, and, and then finally, the point that I'll, I would make is that oftentimes the types of quantum chemistry problems that arise in industry are not really that interesting in the quantum chemistry setting. And similarly, the things that we often focus on in academic quantum chemistry are often not really that relevant to industry. Um, and, you know, there's sort of two examples of this that I, I should just point out. And so one is that, you know, photosynthesis is an example of something that's very interesting quantum chemistry. There's, there's a lot of interesting quantum states and electron and energy dynamics that goes on around uh, the process of photosynthesis. Um, and we in fact know a lot about it because a lot of quantum chemistry and a lot of experimental studies have been done on these systems. Um, but nonetheless, when we are making photovoltaics, it's not necessarily a good strategy to mimic the biological system uh, because what the amount of chemical, the amount of control you need at the atomic level to build the structures that you need that enable the very complicated processes in biological, biological photosynthesis, this level of control is not something you want to rep, uh, reproduce in the industrial scale. So the industrial scale, you just want something that you can easily process. And for that, you want a simple material like silicon. Right? And so that's why uh, one uses silicon for, for photovoltaics. And so the same thing, you know, getting back to fertilizer, you know, is, is true for nitrogenase. So, you know, solving the electronic structure of nitrogenase will not replace the industrial fertilizer process. And I think it's just important to recognize this because in the usual context of bioinorganic chemistry, where people study nitrogenase, one never makes this claim. One never makes the claim that if one is studying the reaction cycle of nitrogenase, one is actually impacting the fertilizer industry. And, and one could not get away with that claim because I, one would not be taken seriously. So I think it's just important to understand the limits of what it means when one is tackling the quantum chemistry of these problems. <laughs>
Okay, so let me now move on to the final part of my talk, which is to discuss quantum advantages for quantum chemistry, uh, given a four tolerant quantum computer. Okay, so, um, so four tolerance is not something we have today. Uh, we are in the NISC era. Um, and, you know, everyone is building NISC devices, it seems. So I'm sure I've missed out lots of people on this list. Um, and at the same time, everyone's running NIST simulations. Uh, and, you know, we couldn't resist. And so here are some simulations from our own group. This is just to illustrate some algorithm that we uh, developed for finite temperature problems. And this is just a correlation function of the transverse field IC model computed on one of uh, IBM's devices. It's really quite nice to see that one can control quantum devices so precisely these days that you can compute some spectrum. This is, well, this is not the spectrum, this is the dynamics of the correlation function. And with you know, sufficient mitigation strategies, obtain hardware traces that you know, really actually look like the thing you computed. So you know, it's really amazing that these devices are around. Um, but on the other hand, I, real quantum chemistry is not compatible with NISC because the Hamiltonians are just too complicated and the accuracy, accuracy requirements are too high. Or, or another way to say this is that, I mean, if one could deal with these Hamiltonians already and the, accuracy, and, and the corresponding accuracy requirements, I, you, you, I think you will have exceeded what you need for error correction. Okay. So, so let's just take this system here. Um, and here's already this rather simplified model, which I described to you, which is about 80 orbitals. And this is the Hamiltonian. And if one just counts up, you know, the number of terms in this Hamiltonian, remember these, in, these indices all range from, you know, one to 76, and then there's some factors of spin, which add factors of two. Uh, you'll have, you know, 10 to nine terms in the Hamiltonian. So it's just a lot of terms. Now you might say, well, some of those terms are small and you can cut them out and do tricks like that. And that's something that we looked at some, some years ago. But even with some sort of clever tricks, or perhaps not so clever tricks, but tricks to, to, to utilize the sparsity of the Hamiltonian, you know, the best we could do to, to encode a single trotted step of the Hamilton is about was something like 10 to the 5, 2 cubic gates. And maybe this number has been reduced by other people and so on and so forth. But it's but it's but compared to what one can currently do, for example, if one looks at the experiment on the sycamore chip to create the Hartree Fox state, which used about 52 cubic gates, it's a large difference. So, so that's one problem. Um, and then the other problem is that the energy, actually the ground state energy of the system is about 10 to the five atomic units, but the excitation gap, which is a relevant energy difference is about 10 to the minus three atomic, units, and that's 10 to the, that's sort of eight um, orders of magnitude. Um, and so the number of measurements or the you know, precision that one would require is I think too high to, uh, to meaningfully simulate the system on a NIST device. Okay, so, so for that reason, um, I'm just going to say something about four tolerant algorithms. And as I laid the disclaimer at the beginning of this talk, I am not a quantum computer scientist, but you know, I will just try my best. Um, so as an example of a four tolerant algorithm, we can uh, think about quantum phase estimation, perhaps the most famous one. Um, and so given an initial state, one is essentially measuring the phase of the Hamiltonian. Um, and of course, then you project by measurement onto some eigenstate and the eigenstate you get depends on the overlap between the initial state and the desired, uh, and the desired eigenstate. So, so the computational cost of quantum phase estimation is just some function of these things, right? So, so uh, there's some probability of success, which depends on this overlap between the states. There's a time you need to apply this operator, so some Hamiltonian simulation time. Um, and then the, the, the amount of time you apply the operator also depends on how many digits of accuracy you want. So, so there's some probability associated with getting the ground state, some Hamiltonian dynamics, and some, um, some time to resolve the energy. Now, it's not the only fault tolerance scheme um, that one can use to get the ground state. There, there are others, um, but they all contain rather similar ingredients. And so they give rise to similar forms of the cost. Um, so, you know, for details, there are these very nice, very nice articles here, which cover and invent some of these algorithms. Um, roughly speaking, these types of functions look a bit like this, right? So it might scale 
the cost scale might scale like one over the overlap or one over the overlap squared. Um, and in terms of the error, you have scalings maybe like one of the error, sometimes called the Heisenberg limit or one of the error to a small power. So I think the interesting question here is, you know, what is a quantum versus a classical advantage with respect to the system size and with respect to the error that you want to get? So let's first deal with the question of quantum advantage uh, with system size. So in this case, in this one really often encounters two, I think, sort of opposing statements, the two contradictory statements. Okay, so, so um, very often one comes across um, articles which, which will say in one way or another that, that when you calculate the energy of an, of, of an atom or molecule using quantum algorithm, it's sort of, sort of polynomial cost versus the exponential cost classically. And so this is the real advantage of doing phase estimation. Um, but on the other hand, one knows that this, this factor here, which is due to uh, the overlap with the initial state or the probability of success, one knows that if one takes some typically arbitrary state, its overlap with the any desired state, such as the ground state, will decrease uh, exponentially with system size. Um, and so that would then lead you to the understanding that finding the ground state is QMA hard, as, as Kitai pointed out a long time ago. Right? So, so one has these sort of two contradictory viewpoints that ground state determination is worst case exponentially hard on a quantum computer versus a sort of much more optimistic statement that phase, phase estimation gives an exponential speed up for quantum chemistry. Right? And so, so the question is, you know, which, you know which, is the, which is the more appropriate viewpoint to hold? Um, and in some ways, uh, the way that I've seen some people try to resolve these two views is to make the conjecture that this factor here is perhaps just not so important for chemistry because maybe chemistry is not a hard case um, and that over the domain of problems that one's interested in, uh, this overlap is always large and doesn't change. For example, if this alpha here was extremely small, you know, 10 to the minus 50, uh, it just wouldn't matter for the types of questions that we are thinking about today. Okay, so, so that's just some conjecture so we can you know, test, if it's, it's sort of, test if it's true. Okay, so what does this overlap really look like? Um, so you know, another way that you see the statement written is that simple states that such as the mean field state uh, will have a good overlap with the true ground state. And so there's a concrete thing we can see if it's, it's true. Um, and so, so let's look at a water molecule. Um, and so water molecule, well, you know, it is a simple molecule. Um, and one can indeed compute the mean field state and, and, and take its overlap with a much more accurate state. And the overlap is really very good. You know, it's very close to one. So in this case, this conjecture is certainly true. Um, but of course, no one is really interested or well, perhaps not, not no one, but very few people are interested in the chemistry of a single water molecule. Uh, on the quantum chemistry side, you, know, you can compute everything to very high precision. Um, so typically when one is simulating water, one has a water box you know, and you know, a typical number in a water box simulation would be you know, a few hundred water molecules. And there you can estimate the overlap uh, just by multiplying out these overlaps because the end uh, just as a first guess and, and then you get a much smaller number. And I don't know if one considers 10 to the minus three to be a good overlap or not, but it's, it's certainly not such a good overlap in this case. Or one could go to a more complicated problem, for example, like this P cluster model, the very simple model. And because it's more, more complicated, uh, one expects the overlaps with simple states to be worse. If one were to take a very rough DMRG state with a small bond dimension, you know, the overlap is you know, something like 10 to the minus two, and it would indeed, although I have not calculated, it is certainly much smaller if one takes the mean field state. Um, and then finally, if one were, for example, to insert the P cluster into the enzyme where there's both multiple of these clusters as well as all the other stuff around, uh, then I think the overlap, we would probably agree, would not be meaningfully different from zero. Um, so I think that it's maybe too optimistic to, uh, to view that the overlap is guaranteed uh, by a simple classical calculation. So 
Um, so this exponential fact, I think, needs to be taken a bit more seriously. Um, and you know, one way in which some people have suggested trying to take it more seriously is to say that, uh, well, you know, the previous overlaps were small because we did the simplest possible classical guess, but maybe we just put a little bit more work in, we would have again a much better almost constant overlap. Um, but the issue with this is that the way classical simulations are designed, usually we talk about the error metric as sort of being the error per atom, actually, usually, uh, not the total energy error. Um, this is just related to the sort of locality. Um, and and the, the types of classical ansatz that we design often have this type of product-like nature. So it's clear that to achieve a constant overlap globally, um, it really means that locally you have to achieve essentially unit overlap as a number of systems gets larger. It means locally you have to solve the problem essentially exactly. And this would be by usual definition of error metrics, which is a local error, essentially an exact simulation. Um, and so, you know, I would argue that simply relying on the classical guess to achieve very good overlaps over the types of problems we want to see is really reduces any of the advantage of the quantum simulation. So I think my view is that the reality is that to avoid the exponential cost of state pressure is a real thing. We can't ignore it. Um, and then to avoid it, you have to just rely on heuristics, just the same way that you do in classical algorithms. And there, of course, can be a much richer set of heuristics because one is doing quantum computing. Um, and then the question of quantum advantage is then a question of comparing the heuristics against heuristics. Um, I, there are many, many heuristics. There's sort of an infinite number one can talk about. So I'll just spend a couple of slides discussing a few. Uh, you know, one that is, I think, very, uh, very natural is to do adiabatic state preparation, where you start in the eigenstate of a simple Hamiltonian and evolve to the eigenstate of the real Hamiltonian slowly. Now, it's it's a nice algorithm. In principle, you can prepare a state with constant overlap in this way, um, and it's clear that the cost is proportional to is some function of the inverse gap. You basically want to go slowly enough that you do not jump into an excited state. I don't have too much to say about the heuristic performance of this in the context of real materials, because I think that there's not enough work out there. But I will say that most effort that I've seen has been directed to understanding whether you can break adiabatic state preparation, for example, by designing problems which have an exponentially vanishing gap. And, and I think that's, you know, for example, you can do this by creating some Anderson localized problem. But I don't actually think that's the most useful setting to understand this if one is interested in real materials, because when one is doing a real material or real mo molecule simulation, you're always simulating a finite chunk of stuff and the gaps are never really, you're not in this asymptotic limit. I mean, it's, it's not so big. Um, and so I think it's more relevant to understand the gap case and then having a finite gap, of course, makes classical simulations easier. And so one has to understand this quantum heuristic versus the classical heuristic in this gap setting. Um, another possible heuristic for state preparation is to, is to use some type of quantum variational state rather than a, some type of classical state, classical variational strategy. Uh, and the idea in these in quantum variational algorithms is, is simply to make circuits that are too deep to emulate classically so you can only you know implement them quantumly. Now there's a wide variety of circuits you can write down so it's a little bit hard to analyze the power of these algorithms um, but there's at least one setting where it's a little bit easier to analyze and that's associated with the circuits um, that generate tensor networks. So for example it's known that a matrix product state used in DMRG is equivalent to applying unitaries over uh, blocks of qubits at a time. Uh, for, for example, this picture here would be, would create a, a matrix product state with bond dimension four because it, it's applied to four plus one qubits at a time. Um, now to turn this into a quantum, uh, uh, to, to a quantum variational problem, Essentially, what one can do is simply decide to construct this unitary in a very sparse way by a quantum circuit. And that way, one can use a very small number of gates but act on a lot of qubits and effectively have a very large bond dimension. I mean, this is the sort of defining idea, I think, of 
deep tensor networks uh, originally proposed by Kim and Swingle and which have been developed by many, many other people since. The real question is, are these circuits, I mean, formally they correspond to uh, tensor networks, which are difficult to emulate, but are they variously powerful? And I think it's not really known, um, but I think there is a little bit of work that is now beginning to answer this question. You know, so we've done some work ourselves, and this is a simulation where we use, for example, traditional DMRG versus matrix product states where we're using very sparse representations, more appropriate to a quantum computer. And one can see that as a function of the number of parameters, you can typically get much smaller errors than the traditional DMRG, indicating that these sparse variational ansatz are in fact, uh, and do in fact bring something new, okay? Um, so more work needs to be done though to really understand the relative power. And then finally, there are many other heuristics which I won't go into. Okay, so I've just got, I think, two more slides because it's been, I've, there have been many talks today, so I should wrap up soon. And so, um, so I've mainly talked about quantum advantage for, um, as a function of increasing the system size. But now let me talk about quantum advantage if I assume the system size is fixed, in which case one is really talking about the relative power of quantum algorithms to get to a certain accuracy for fixed system size versus classical algorithms to get to a certain accuracy. Now, out of all the fault tolerant algorithms, the best scaling one achieves here is one over epsilon. Um, and so the question to ask then is how do classical uh, quantum chemistry methods scale with one over epsilon? Now, this is a question which actually quantum chemists never really ask. So when one talks about the computational cost of the method, you never give this one over epsilon behavior because you just do not know what it is. Okay, so it's really not widely studied. Uh, and you know, I don't even know if the right way to think about some of the methods is in this product form. You can imagine that the cost has a, has a much more complicated functional dependence where n and epsilon are somehow coupled together in some way. Um, but leaving aside those issues, one can at least empirically say, if I fix n and then I do some numerical studies, how do things, you know, how much computer compute time do I need to get to a certain one over epsilon? So I just show you some slide that I put together just using data I happen to have lying around. Um, and this is from DMRG. And so, so this is a calculation on some molecule, this benzene, where, where we have some estimate of the exact result. Um, and this is the error as I, I, as I look at one over the bond dimension in DMRG. And you see the plot looks very linear. It's not perfectly linear, but it looks very linear. And so if I assume for the moment that it is linear, uh, then if I'm saying the error looks like one of the bond dimension and the cost of the algorithm looks like the bond dimension cubed. And so that will tell me that the, the, the scaling for fixed air with one of epsilon, one of epsilon cubed. And, and, and perhaps that's what it is. Um, but one notices actually the curve is going down, right? It should, really, it should really go down to zero here and it's curving downward. So maybe it's not actually one over M. And there is in fact, a little bit of evidence that it has a more complicated form that it scales like this, e to the minus log m to the alpha, which is a very funny function. It, it's a, it's not, it's faster than one sees for large m is, is faster than e to the minus alpha log m, right? So it's a function that is faster than uh, any inverse polynomial. Um, and, you know, I, I, I don't, don't have a lot of data with a lot of these plots, but, uh, but but an important point is that if it's faster than any inverse polynomial, it would be faster than one over, the resulting cost would be to achieve a certain epsilon would scale better than one over epsilon. So that would in fact be better than the current fault tolerance schemes. So this is just a plot from really old data where the energy is plotted against log m squared on this log log plot. You do indeed see this type of linear behavior suggesting it has uh, this type of functional form. Um, and there, is, there are some analytic arguments for this uh, uh, based on the eigenvalues of what would today be called the entanglement Hamiltonian <clears throat> uh, that although I, back, in, back then this name had not yet been coined. But I think this question needs to be more closely re-examined. And in general, the error scaling of classical methods needs to be properly studied. Okay, so that brings me to the end of my talk. Uh, thanks for sitting through all of it. There's been many talks today. Uh, so I'll just, the beginning of my talk really just made the statement that quantum chemistry 
is amongst the most successful areas of applied classical computing and quantum mechanics, in my opinion. And you know, this is not to make a boastful claim about quantum chemistry. It's really just to say that chemical systems are in some ways not that complicated. Um, and so all the peculiar entanglement that you can generate in a quantum computer is not entirely clear if you know, it, fi it finds its most useful application in describing uh, the problems of quantum chemistry. Um, now, even with a fault tolerant quantum computer, I don't think there's a, in my view, strong support for seeing an exponential speed up because as far as I understand, uh, the claims to, towards this essentially rely on two things. They rely on the assertion that the classical cost is exponential uh, and one is also neglecting the exponential state preparation cost. So, so in my view that there is not a strong support for, uh, for this possibility. Um, but nonetheless, I mean, even if it's boiling down to quantum heuristics and polynomial speedups, you know, polynomial speedups are great, especially if they're large polynomials. Um, and to understand what that kind of thing looks like, we really have to carefully compare quantum heuristics versus classical heuristics, which I think really just hasn't yet been, there is not enough of that right now, perhaps because we don't have fault tolerant quantum computers. Um, but regardless of what the case of the situation, as long as a quantum computer is built, I am certain that quantum chemists will find a way to use it. And that brings me to the end of my talk. So thank you. Thank you for very interesting and very uh, wonderful talk. And now it's open to questions. I, I have a couple of questions, which uh, Yangzi, I want to ask first, OK? OK. Uh, I have many questions, but I'm going to ask only three. Uh, uh, so the first one is, uh, you know, this deep tensor network, and in general, all the recent developments in tensor network, which are very exciting. Do you think that, that maybe Hubbard model will be solved long before a quantum computer comes along this line, essentially tensor network, coupled with other techniques? Well, I guess the question is, what, what would you consider the solution of the Hubbard model? So okay. how many decimal places? That is a very good question. Let, let's yeah. on the level of condensed matter physics, not on the level of quantum chemistry. Yeah. You know, just knowing the phases very roughly, for example. So, you know, in, in some of the work that, you know, I was part of on the strike, strike part of the Hubbard model, one, one eighth doping at U equals at large U. Mm -hmm. um, what we could see was that you can, that the best numerical methods agree to um, in the energy per site to a few milli T, so about 10 to the minus three of the hopping. Mm -hmm. Now, the fact is that in the Hubbard model, there can nonetheless be energy scales lower than that. For example, if you think about phase separations of stripes of different wavelengths over really long energy scales and so on and so forth, you know, the energy scales get smaller and smaller. They may get, you know, exponentially small. So 10 to the minus three, you know, three decimal places may not be Good enough. enough. Yeah. 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 But my view, you know, having worked in that this problem a little bit is, is it really that important to know, nope. know that result, right? Um, so it's not for a very simple reason that the system that you want to study, the real system you want to study, will not follow Hubbard model with that level of accuracy. Yes, that's my, exactly my view. So my my so I basically you know focus much more on on moving on, you know, saying well how to extend these things to the real Cooper's, right. but but I mean there seem to be sort of eternal problems like you know J one J two like or you know, all of these highly frustrated spin systems where it seems no matter how many decimal places you get, there's another phase which pops up. <laughs> yeah, so, okay, you and I totally agree. I just wanted to make sure you and I 100% agree, okay? My yeah, second okay. question is uh, on, the, on the possible speed up or not for the quantum chemistry problem using quantum computer. Again, everything you said, I completely agree. And, you know, and places I consult with, I tell them this all the time, not in the level of details you are saying it, but same uh, same message. But I have a specific question. Is it known uh, for some model what the speed up is? What is the polynomial? Uh, it's some high power, I presume, you know, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, something like that. Meaning even any advantage may be very, very weak, right? If 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 quantum computer is solving the problem at n to the power 20, where any of the number of electrons, it yeah. doesn't help much. I mean, so I'm not aware of um of of any statement that 
defines in a rigorous sense like some particular polynomial speed up. Uh -huh, uh, although it is, you know, generically the case, it seems to me that you all very often get quadratic speed ups, you know, from a quantum computer. Right? So, but I, it's just, it's very hard to prove these things. So, so it really, I mean, people have to do more com heuristics by, by emulation I, 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 to say things, I think. Um, so there is no unique question or unique answer to this question depends on the question. Okay, that I, that's very interesting. And, and my last question is that, you know, again, there are uh, people, very high powered people in, in, in the top companies who feel that quantum computer can help drug design. I mean, I, I think it's completely crazy. It's not, because my understanding in drug design it's not the quantum chemistry part that that that's uh, you know is the cost limiting factor because Carparinello plus configuration interaction does a pretty good job as you yeah. just said. Is that is the clinical trial? The problem is clinical trial where quantum computer is not going to help at all. Yeah. So you know, um, you know, as you know, as as you know, there are many many reasons for people to take different to take whatever position they take on this problem. Yes. Um, but I can only say that the way, you know, the current, it, if you could just compute the binding energy of a drug to a protein, which is how people hope to use quantum methods, you know, that's, that's sometimes used as like a proxy for whether a drug is of any benefit. Um, there, there are two things. I mean, one is that that problem can be, it, that there is no exotic process going on in drug binding. So it, it can be, as you stated, in principle done very well with mean field methods. It's just typically the mean field methods are themselves too expensive to apply. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> it's uh, a large computer to do that even. Right? Yeah, yeah. Um, but then the second thing is, I mean, as you say, there are just so many other issues, right? So just because a drug binds to protein, it really yeah. says very little about its sort of influence that's on point, disease. Yeah, that's point one percent of your cost. Even if you make that zero, it's not really changing anything, right? So yeah, yeah. I, I, yes, that that is completely the state currently, and that's why in drug companies, while there are there are definitely computational design teams, they they are a small part of the yep. total yep. research. I mean. Very interesting. Many of yeah. the things I suspected, uh, it's very good to know for a professional quantum chemist like you, who really want your numbers to be precise, that you have some reservation, not reservations from an intellectual viewpoint. Do you all want a quantum computer? I mean, yeah. no question about it. I'd be very happy to use one. Right, right? exactly. Yeah. But about the hype part of it, you know. <laughs> yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I don't think I make too many friends, but I mean, I think... You know, like you say, there is a reality to it that, I mean, I think is yeah. there, you know, well, anyway, yes. This, no, I think you, I, thank you very much. This was a yes. very, very instructive talk for me. I mean, uh, thank you very much for actually doing what I asked you, that think of the whole audience as just one person, just me. And I learned a lot from your talk, okay? Thank, thank you. you very much. Okay, uh, is there any other question? So maybe I can ask a very quick question. In your previous slide, uh, you show this uh, interesting error scaling. Yeah, here, right here. I'm just curious about the alpha. Is it larger than one or smaller than one? Yeah, it's not, I think larger than one. But Okay, okay. Uh, yeah, but I don't, you know, there, there's some empirical work and then, you know, Okanishi and then I did some work many, many years ago, but I don't think that, uh, you know, someone should really study this again, because it really wasn't that important a question before, you know, thinking about the error scaling. At the time, it was only relevant to say, if I wanted to extrapolate my numbers to get slightly better result, what should it be, right? But that's, a, nowadays, if the question is like, what is the, you know, in principle, the benefit of classical, of class variable versus quantum variable, it seems like a much bigger question. And so I think, um, someone mm -hmm. should study it they, they, with, you know, better mathematical tools than, you know, what I had available. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Is there any other question? Okay. If not, let's thank uh, uh, Kane again. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. Bye. Thank you.
I think that's all for today. Thank you, Yangzi. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you, Shankar.